Good morning. Good morning. Welcome. We're so glad that you're here on this beautiful fall Sunday morning as we've come together for the purpose of worshiping the Lord. We trust that that's what you're here for today. If you're visiting with us, we're glad that you're visiting with us. And we uh, have a visitor bag that we would like to give you and our ushers will tell you more about that in just a few minutes. Remember this afternoon is men's flag football. Last week was our first Sunday. We do it for four Sundays in October and we ended up on October 22nd uh, with a flag football tournament. Uh, we need you to help us. Uh, even if you don't play football, we need you to help us. It takes a lot of people to make this work. And we had a great crowd last week. Thank you to all the ones that came and helped. Uh, and we appreciate those that play. Uh, youth community outreach. If you have a youth, uh, we believe that it is important for our young people to understand inviting people to church. And so for the month of October, we do community outreach. And so please be sure that your children are here, your youth are here on time to go out into the community and share with them invitations regarding church. And also, if you're somebody that says, well, I could help, we need drivers. Uh, we put about two or three youth with a driver and so if you could drive, we would appreciate that. The youth kayaking trip is next Saturday. And so uh, youth, be aware of that. Pastor Jaden has more information. Uh, discipleship and outreach team and church council meet next Sunday. Uh, please be aware of that. All right? Uh, Ms. Deborah has something that she wants to share with us. All right, just, just real quick. Quick, uh, he was going to mention about the Christmas shoe boxes. We are in the middle of Operation Christmas Child. We are a little bit behind where we ought to be to make our goal. So thank you to all of you who have donated and who have picked up boxes to take home. But we have a long way to go. So if you have not done that, please do so today. Uh, start filling those and get them back to me. Um, again, if you don't want to shop, I take donations. I would love to shop for you and pack a box for you. You can see me, and I will take care of that for you. Thank you. All right. Remember, prayer requests, we want to pray for you, but we can't pray for you if you don't know what, our, what your needs are. So if you have prayer requests, please be sure that you go to the church app. I fill out the prayer request, prayer request, and at the bottom, be sure you hit Submit. Uh, then Pastor Danny gets those, and we send those out tomorrow to a group of people who have agreed to pray with us and pray for you. Let's stand together and invite God's blessing on our services today. <laughs> Father, thank you so much for the opportunity that we have to be here again today to fellowship one with another, but mostly to fellowship with you. We realize that worship is an opportunity for, we, for us to share how awesome you are and to thank you and praise you for who you are and for all the things that you do in our life. Father, I pray today that the Holy Spirit will anoint Deborah as she leads us, be with the praise band as they play and lead in worship, and be with Pastor Dan as he brings the message today. Father, I pray that everything that we do will be pleasing to you. And Father, that our worship will be acceptable and pleasing as we glorify you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's remain standing, Deborah. What a great day to be in God's house. Amen. We're going to begin um, the song portion of our song service together this morning by singing together, Blessed Assurance, Jesus is Mine. Blessed assurance, Jesus is Praising 
let's continue in our worship together and sing together victory in Jesus. victory in Jesus. He's still in the healing business. He's still in the miracle working business. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen. Let's continue in our worship and sing This is Amazing Grace.
It gets me so excited to think about the goodness of God. We serve a great, great God who is still the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. And that's exactly what this song says. My God is still the same. I'm so thankful for that this morning. I hope you will sing this in worship with me together. My God is still the same. Just as the waves, if they are still at the mention of His name, they'll say, my God is still the same. Just as the walls, if they still fall at the mighty sound of take that to the bank as they say amen my god is still the same and he'll never change folks everything he's ever said every promise that he's ever made has come true we're just waiting on this one he says i'll come again and he is coming again and it's closer today than it was yesterday we we'll sing this together this morning oh what a glorious day When heaven was filled with His praises, one day when sin was as black as could be, Jesus came forth to be born of a virgin, dwelt among men, my example.
see Jesus face to face and it's only going to be exciting for those that know him it's all did you hear what I said it's only going to be exciting for those that know him do you know him this morning do you know that you know that you know that you got a relationship with Jesus father God I just pray right now in this moment that if there is anyone in the sound of my voice that does not know you Father, I pray that today would be the day of salvation for them. Holy Spirit, speak to their hearts. Draw them unto you. And may they make a decision, the most important decision of their entire life, to know that you are their Savior. Father, I pray for Pastor Danny as he comes and brings the word this morning. Lord, I pray you'd give him boldness to speak and proclaim your word in power. And may we respond in a way that would be pleasing to you. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray. And all of God's people said, amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Good morning. This is our time. As, as the slide says, giving, offering to the Lord. That check may, may say the Church of Eastern Oaks on it, but it's to the glory of the Lord that we're giving it to, church. And if anyone has looked at our financial statement, we have been blessed with a congregation who gives, and also a church who gives, who sends out. The ushers would come forth. Just remember this morning that...
this is a part of our worship service. This is an act of worship, church, an act of obedience to the Lord Jesus Christ and to God. And right now, I just ask that and pray that you will search your heart. And if you have any difficulties in giving, tithe or offering, just search your heart and pray to the Lord just to reveal your heart to yourself. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, Lord, I thank you for this time this morning. Lord, I thank you for each and every one who's here in attendance, Lord, or, or over social media, Lord, or, or through our media services. Father, I pray, Lord, that each and every one at the sound of my voice, Lord, will just search their hearts this morning, Lord, just to be obedient to you in giving, Lord. And, Lord, that it may be an act of worship, Lord, not out of necessity, Lord, out of guilt, Lord, but, no, out of love for you. And, Lord, that just to know, Lord, that the Church of Eastern Oaks, Lord, prays over it, Lord, and uses it for your glory and your honor. Father, right now, Lord, I ask you to bless this gift, Lord. Bless the giver and giving, Father. Bless each and every one. Bless our service today, Lord. May, may you bless Pastor Danny as he brings your word. May our hearts and souls be receptive to your Holy Spirit. It's for in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Good morning. If you're anything like me, I imagine that at some point in your life, you have thought to yourself, if I just had a little more money, life would be easier. Have you ever thought that? Everybody's thought that, okay? You, know, you, you can be the super Christian and say, I have never thought that in my life. Which just means you're a liar, so you're not really much of a super Christian, okay? Because everybody at some point has thought, you know, if, if I just had a little more, if I just had a little more, things would, would be different. We've all thought that before. And if we're just being honest with one another, money is nice to have. Amen? Amen. 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 Money is, is nice to have. Money does not solve all of our problems, but money does solve a lot of problems. Amen? Let me, let's, let's just be honest. If you have rent due, money solves that problem. If you're hungry, money solves that problem. If you need clothes, money solves that problem. So no, I'm not saying money solves every problem. We're going to talk about that this morning. But if we're being fair, if we're being truthful, money does solve a lot of problems. And so we've absolutely thought to ourselves, you know, if I just had a little bit more, 
I imagine you've all played the game with yourself where you say, if I won the lottery, here's what I would do. In fact, just, just this past summer, just this past summer, one of the lotteries reached over $1.5 billion. That's billion with a B. I'm not a math major. I'm not a math person. But that's a lot of dollars. That's a lot of dollars. I mean, think about it like this for a moment. To be a millionaire, you have to have how much? See, you guys are math majors. Y'all got this together. To be a millionaire, you need a million dollars. Now, would a million dollars change your life? Absolutely. If I gave you a million dollars today, I think it would change your life. I don't think there's anybody here that would say, I, I wouldn't even notice if you gave me a million dollars. I think we're all caught up in the same boat here, all right, folks? And that boat is, if you gave me a million dollars, it would make a big difference. It would absolutely change my mind. It would change your life. And that's a million dollars. But to be a billionaire, you need how much? A billion dollars. That means to be a billionaire, you would need to be a millionaire 1,000 times over. A billion is 1,000 times a million. I did it on my calculator this week. Trust me, I'm right. If you're thinking, that doesn't sound right. It's, it's right, right? If you take a million dollars and multiply it by 10, you don't have a billion. Or 100, you don't have a billion. Or 999, you don't have a billion. You have to multiply a million times 1,000 to be a billionaire. Now, in the time we have left this morning, I want to ask you not to give in to the temptation to spend the rest of the worship service thinking about what you would do if you had a billion dollars. Okay? You have the rest of the day to do that. Take all the time you want and think about your billion. But for the next 30 minutes or so, I ask you to hold off on spending your billion dollars. Okay? What I do want you to do this morning is turn with me to Genesis chapter 13. Get your Bibles out this morning. Turn with me to Genesis chapter 13. And as we're going to see in just a moment, the Scripture literally says, Abram was very rich. Now, I don't know what that looks like in today's terms. I don't know if that's millionaire or billionaire. I just know the Scripture says that Abram was very rich. We'll talk about how rich in just a moment. But what we want to do this morning is we want to look at how money affected Abram and his family. And as we look at how money affected him and how money affected his family, we're going to be able to highlight five truths this morning about money and riches that you can apply to your life. So we're going to write these in your bulletin. You can write these in your Genesis journals. But I want to give you five financial truths this morning that you can apply to your life. So in Genesis 13, we find a very strong and faithful Abram. In fact, this chapter both starts and ends with Abram worshiping God. And throughout the chapter, he makes really good decisions. Now don't forget what happened last week. We can't really... We can't really understand how surprising this is without forgetting this comes on the heels of Genesis chapter 12. And in Genesis chapter 12, Abram lied about his wife to get out of trouble. Right? You remember that? He pawns his wife off on Pharaoh to save his own life. But then we turn to Genesis chapter 13 and we find a very different Abram. We find a faithful Abram. We find an Abram worshiping God. We find an Abram who is making good decisions. And this is interesting because this is really indicative of what we find as we continue to follow Abram. What you see is there are ups and there are downs in Abram's life. There are times he makes really bad decisions like selling his wife to Pharaoh. And then there are times he makes really good decisions like we're going to see here in Genesis chapter 13. He makes smart decisions and he makes dumb decisions. But let's be honest, folks. That's all of us. Amen? 
Man, we can absolutely see ourselves in Abram because he had ups and he had downs. He had good days and he had bad days. He had days where you looked at him and you're like, wow, that is a man of faith. And then you have the next day where you look at him and you think, wow, could you be dumber? Right? But we've all been there, right? We've all been there. We've all had days just like this. And so today... In Genesis 13, we're looking at one of Abram's good days. We're looking at an example of him making good decisions, right decisions, and that is how he dealt with his wealth. So let's read this together. If you have your Bibles, Genesis chapter 13, we're going to start reading just the first seven verses together. Genesis chapter 13, starting in verse 1. So Abram went up from Egypt, he and his wife and all that he had, and Lot with him into the Negev. Now Abram was very rich in livestock, in silver, and in gold. And he journeyed on from the Negev as far as Bethel to the place where his tent had been at the beginning between Bethel and Ai, to the place where he had made an altar at the first. And there Abram called upon the name of the Lord. You see, I'm just going to stop you right there. We see Abram right here doing the one thing he didn't do in the last chapter, right? He didn't call on the name of the Lord. He didn't seek the Lord for guidance. He didn't seek the Lord for help. But here he's calling on the name of the Lord. Verse 5, And Lot, who went with Abram, also had flocks and herds and tents, so that the land could not support both of them dwelling together, for their possessions were so great that they could not dwell together. Verse 7, and there was strife. Remember that, that's important. And there was strife between the herdsmen of Abram's livestock and the herdsmen of Lot's livestock. At that time, the Canaanites and the Parasites were living in the land. So let's stop right there for a moment. I want to start by just calling your attention to two specific verses. First, notice in verse 2 that Scripture tells us that Abram was rich in livestock, in silver, and in gold. To put this in today's term, Abram was loaded. He was richy rich rich. He was Scrooge McDuck rich. Right? I don't know if y'all are familiar with those famous rich people, okay? But he was Scrooge McDuck rich. He was, he was diving into his money, swimming through his vault. Uh, that's that kind of money, right? He's Richie Rich getting on his helicopter, flying to his mansion rich, okay? He's Warren Buffett rich, right? So Abram is, is very rich. Now, listen to me. If money is the answer to all problems in this life, Abram should have no problems, right? There should be no issues. There should be no problems. If money equates to an easy life, Abram should have it easy, right? Because that's what the world tells us today. Money solves all your problems. Money gives you an easy life. Money is what you need. If that were the case, then we should read, and Abram had no problems. Abram was rich in livestock and silver and in gold. And if the world is right, then it should go on to say, and so Abraham had no trouble. Abraham had no problems because he had money. But is that what we found? No. That's not what we find. Again, look at the first words of verse 7. The very first words of verse 7 says, And there was strife. If money solved everything, there should be no strife. There should be no problems. There should be no issues. But there was strife. There's a consensus in the world today that money is the answer, that money will solve all your problems, that if we all just had a little bit more money, everything would be better. But please listen to me very closely, church. That is an absolute lie from the pits of hell. Do you understand? Money is not the answer. Yes, money can absolutely solve some problems. I'm not saying it can't. But money causes just as many problems as it solves. Biblically speaking, neither poverty nor riches is spiritually superior. Both have pros and cons. The Bible literally warns about being poor and being rich. Why? Because it's not spiritually better to be rich. It's not spiritually better to be poor. Again, the the, the heresy that is the prosperity gospel says, if you're doing what you're supposed to do, God's going to give you money and wealth and riches. That's just a lie. There's nothing spiritually superior to wealth. 
There's nothing superior, spiritually superior to having money. And so no, God is not going to bless every believer with money. In fact, let's be honest. For a lot of people, it's a blessing that God doesn't give us more money because we wouldn't know what to do with it. We'd make a mess of things. The first lesson that I want us to gain from this passage is this. Riches do not equate to an easy life. If you're keeping notes this morning, this is the first thing you need to write down. You need to write this big and bold. Riches do not equate to an easy life. Riches do not solve all your problems. Money is not all that you need. As Pastor R. Kent Hughes writes, the irony, and it is an irony of human existence, is that the material blessing of God upon Abram and Lot fueled the problem. Notice that. It's a great irony that God's blessing Abram is what caused the problem. Why? Because we're sinners. We're sinful, fallen people. We're selfish people. And so oftentimes, it's the very things that God blesses us with that cause problems in our life. Not because the blessing is bad, but because we're messed up. And that's exactly what we see here with Abram. It's the money that caused the problems. If you were raised in the 90s, like I was, you may remember the words of the great philosopher, Notorious (laughs) B.I.G., who famously said, Mo money, mo problems. Right? Y'all may not understand the great philosophers like I do. That's okay. Now listen, don't, don't misunderstand what I'm saying. Money's not bad. Money's not evil. That's not what I'm saying. But it's also not the solution to every problem. It is not our greatest need. Listen to me closely, church. Money is not your Savior. But we often look at it as if it is, right? If I had just a little bit more, if I could make just a little bit more, money is not your Savior. Money is not the answer to every problem. Once again, spiritually speaking, money is neutral. It is neither good nor bad. It is not good or evil. It can be used for good, and it can be used for evil. It can be a great blessing for you, or it can be a great downfall for you. So the first thing we need to understand here this morning as we're looking at Abram is, look, money can be great, but it can also be a problem. It is not the end-all, be-all. It is not the source of an easy life. Again, it's neither good nor bad. It's how we use it that matters. And as Genesis 13 clearly demonstrates, money does not guarantee an easy life. Regardless of your wealth or your lack of wealth, you will have difficulties in this life. You will have trials in this life. You will have struggles in this life, just like Abram did. So how did Abram handle this? Let's keep reading. Let's look at how he handled this situation, this strife. Starting in verse 8. Genesis chapter 13, we're going to read uh, verses 8 through 13. Then Abram said to Lot, Let there be no strife between you and me, and between your herdsmen and my herdsmen, for your kinsmen. Is not the whole land before you? Separate yourself from me. If you take the left hand, then I'll go to the right. Or if you take the right hand, then I'll go to the left. And Lot lifted up his eyes and saw that the Jordan Valley was well watered everywhere, like the garden of the Lord like the land of Egypt in the direction of Zeor. This was before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. So Lot chose for himself all the Jordan Valley, and Lot journeyed east. Thus they separated from each other. Abram settled in the land of Canaan, while Lot settled among the cities of the valley and moved his tent as far as Sodom. Now the men of Sodom were wicked, great sinners against the Lord. Now let's start by identifying the problem here. Both Abram and Lot were rich. They were so rich and they had so much stuff that it was impossible for them to live together anymore. They said, look, we just got too much stuff. How many of you want to try having that problem for a little while, right? That's a problem I'll sign up for. They had too much stuff. They couldn't live together anymore. They needed more space. Now, early in verse 7, we read that this was causing strife. It was causing strife between Abram's herdsmen and Lot's herdsmen. In other words, people are starting to fight. People are starting to argue. People aren't getting along. There's all this back and forth. 
And what we see here is, again, a truth that we've already mentioned, a truth that you may have already experienced at some point in your own life, and that's this. Not only does money not solve all your problems, but money often is the cause of your problems. In fact, money often complicates our relationships. That's what we see going on here in Genesis 13. Their relationships are are struggling. Money often complicates our relationships. As a pastor, I do a lot of counseling. I do premarital counseling. I do marriage counseling. And I tell couples all the time that there are three things that study after study, survey after survey, says there are three things that most married couples fight about. And you know what one of the top ones is? Money. If you're just curious, the other two are sex and family. Those are the top three things marriages struggle with. But money is always near the top of the list. Money complicates our relationships. Couples argue about who's making more money or who should be making more money. They argue about how much money to save. They argue about how much money they should spend. They argue about how much money they shouldn't spend. They argue about who spent the most money or who got to spend more money. Over and over, what we see is money complicates our relationships. And it's not just the case with marriages. Parents and children fight over money. I won't mention them by name, but I have a daughter um, (laughs) who who has what's called a green light card. I don't know if anybody's familiar with a green light card. It's this little credit card thing, and, and I put money on the card, and that way if she's out at school or she's at a, a football game or she does marching band, if she's somewhere and I'm not there and she needs food or whatever, she has this card that she can buy things with. But I put the money <laughs> on the card. We had a disagreement one morning as we were discussing a purchase that this, I'm not going to mention her name, this person wanted to make. And this person told me, it's okay, I have money on my cart. (laughs) And I said, no, no, you don't understand. You don't have any money. You have zero money. I have money on that cart, right? I put money on that cart. You can do whatever I say you can do with that money because that's my money. Listen, marriages fight about money. Parents and children fight about money. Friends fight about money. Siblings fight about money. Everybody argues and and, and disagrees and has strife when it comes to money. It's no secret that money can put a strain on our relationships, which is why we can benefit here from looking at Abram in Genesis chapter 13 and looking at what he did. So don't miss this. Pay very close attention. Look with me again at verse 8 and 9. Then Abram said to Lot, Let there be no strife between you and me, and between your herdsmen and my herdsmen, for we are kinsmen. Is not the whole land before you? Notice what he does. Separate yourself from me. If you take the left, I'll take the right. If you take the right, I'll take the left. Listen, Abram responds by saying, Look, there's, there's no reason to fight. There's plenty of space. And then don't miss this. This is the important part. Abraham says, You choose. I won't choose. You choose. You go wherever you want to go. If you want to go left, that's fine. Go left. I'll go right. If you want to go right, that's fine. You go right, I'll go left. Now listen, don't don't miss this. Abram was the authority figure. Abram was in charge. Abram could have gone wherever he wanted to go. Abram could have told Lot where to go. Remember in my previous illustration, I said, it's all my money. It was all Abram's, right? It was Abram who had the blessing of the Lord. It was Abram who had the promise of God. Everything was Abram's. But notice what he does. He says, you can choose. It's it's okay. You you go wherever you want to go. I don't have to make the decision. You can make the decision. I don't know if this ever causes problems in your house, but one of the biggest sources of conflict in my house is who gets to choose. Again, I won't mention their names, but I have two children. And it doesn't matter what they're choosing, they will fight to choose. Right? My children fight over who gets to choose the movie we're going to watch or who gets to choose where we're going to eat dinner or who gets to choose what music we listen to in the car. If we said, hey, who wants to run out in the street and get hit by a Mack truck? My kids would argue about who gets to go first. Right? 
They want to choose. If someone gets to choose something, there's going to be a fight. But listen, here's what Abram does. Abram's like, I don't have to choose. You choose. You do whatever you want to do. And I'll go the other way. Why did he do this? There are two reasons, listen to me, two reasons that Abram felt comfortable allowing Lot to choose. And we can learn from both of these. First, and most importantly, Abram had faith in God. He knew God's going to take care of me wherever I end up. If you want to go left, Lot, fine, go left. I'll go to the right, and God's going to bless me because He said He's going to bless me. If you want to go right, fine, go right. I'm going to go left, and guess what? God's going to bless me because God said He's going to bless me. Abram said, I have faith in God. I trust God. It doesn't matter which way I go because wherever I go, God's good. Wherever I go, God's going to take care of me and bless me because He promised He would. So I'll go left, I'll go right, I'll go forward, I'll go back. It doesn't make any difference to me whatsoever. Abram understood the sovereignty of God. Listen to me. Abram understood that God is in control of all things. He said, listen, Lot, you think you're in control, but you're not. God's in control. If you want to go left, fine. I'm going to go right and everything's going to be fine. If you want to go right, fine. I'll go left and everything's going to be fine. Why? Because you're not actually in charge. And I'm not actually in charge. God is in charge. God is sovereign. And God will keep His promises. God has made me promises. He is going to keep those promises. And it makes no difference which way I go. God is good. And He's going to keep His promises. Because of His faith... Abram didn't have to be afraid of allowing someone else to choose. He could let Lot have first choice. He could let Lot have the very best of the best. He said, hey, look out, look whatever looks good to you, take what looks good to you. Why? Because his faith was in God. Old Testament scholar Kenneth Matthews writes, By granting Lot first option of the covenanted Canaan, the patriarch resisted any, prior, prior, excuse me, any proprietary jealousy, leaving his future in the hands of the Lord. You see, it didn't matter to Abram which land Lot chose, because Abram knew an important truth that we need to make sure we understand as well. Our security is in God, not wealth. Write this down with me this morning. Our security is in God, not wealth. And God can keep me secure if I go left or right or forward, as long as I'm in His will. You understand? As long as I'm in His will, then God's going to keep me secure. God's going to keep me safe. Listen, God's going to do what He wants to do. Does that mean everything's going to go my way and I'm always going to get what I want? No. But God's going to be glorified, and that's what I want. You see, one of the greatest temptations of wealth is that it will give us security. If you think about it, that's why we want a little bit more. We want a little bit more so we can feel secure. We want a little bit more so we can have what we need. We want to make sure we have a house and food and take care of our children, and we think money provides that. If I had just a little bit more money, I'd feel safe. I'd feel secure. But listen to me, we're making a big mistake when we think that way because what we're doing is we're putting our security in wealth. And that's the exact opposite of what God tells us to do. Scripture tells us this in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 17. The Apostle Paul writes, As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. Paul is very clear. He says, listen, don't count on money. Don't put your security in wealth and things. Trust God. Trust God. He is going to give you what you need. You say, well, but He's not giving me all I want. He never promised to give you all you want. In fact, in many cases, if God gave us everything we want, we'd ruin it. So the primary reason that Abram let Lot choose first is that he had faith in God. He knew God would take care of him. However, there, there's, another, there's another important lesson that we find when it comes to wealth. Not only did Abram trust God for his security, but he also prioritized relationships over riches. 
He prioritized relationships over riches. Listen, Abram didn't care which land was better, which soil was more fertile, or which had the better watering source. All of those things were important, right? But Abram didn't care. He said, Lot, I value you more than riches. What is it that Abram says? He says, let's not argue. Why? Because we're kinsmen. We're family. He says, let's not make this an issue between us. If you want to go left, go left. That's fine. If you want to go right, go right. But let's not let this come between us. Relationships matter more than riches. Listen to me, church. People matter more than possessions. It's another lesson we can learn from Genesis 13 if you're keeping notes this morning. We prioritize relationships over riches. We prioritize relationships over riches. If money is causing a problem for the relationships in your life, if money is causing strife in your marriage, you may be valuing money too much. If that's causing a problem with your husband, or your wife, your, your kids, your, your, your brothers, your sisters, your friends, if you are constantly in strife over money, one of the reasons may be because you place way too high of a priority over money. And what we need to do is, is exactly what Abram did, which is say relationships matter more. People matter more. If you're married today, please understand the health of your marriage matters a million times more than how much money you have. Prioritize your relationships, not riches. Oftentimes, we need to reevaluate our priorities. And if we find ourselves constantly having strife over money, over possessions, over things our priorities are probably out of line. Because Jesus tells us what the greatest commandments are. You know this well. Matthew 22, verses 37 through 39. When asked what are the greatest commandments in the law, He said to them, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Loving your neighbor, loving people, is more important than money. Love God and love people. Those are our priorities. Not wealth, not possessions, not retirement, not comfort, not an easy life, not getting just a little bit more, not getting ahead just a little bit more, not getting another promotion or another raise. That is not the priority. The priority is loving people, and it should start with the people in your life. Your love for your spouse, your love for your children, your love for your parents. That matters so much more than anything else. Abram clearly had his priorities right in this instance, but what about Lot? Well, Abram allowed Lot to choose, but how did Lot go about making his decision? Did Lot say, you know what, Abram, I really appreciate it. Let's be fair about this. I want to be fair. I want to be equitable. I want to do the right thing by you. I want to make sure that, you know, we're both treated right. No. That's not what Lot did. Let's look at what Lot did. Go back to verse 10. Genesis 13, verse 10. And Lot lifted up his eyes and saw that the Jordan Valley was well watered everywhere like the garden of the Lord, like the land in Egypt in the direction of Zeor. And of course, this was before, Lot, uh, before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. So Lot chose for himself the Jordan Valley and Lot journeyed east. Thus they separated from each other. Where Abram is selfless, Lot is selfish. Lot clearly makes a decision based on the world's wisdom. Lot said simply this, If I'm going to choose, I'm going to choose the best for me. If it's my choice, I'm going to look out and I'm going to find the absolute best for myself and I'm going to take the best for me. Forget about the fact that the only reason Lot is blessed in this situation is because he's riding Abram's coattails, right? The only reason he has anything is because he's hanging out with a man blessed by God. And so what you should say is, hey, I only have anything because of you. So you take whatever you want. You take the best. But no, Lot says, if I'm going to choose, I'm going to pick what I want. I'm going to pick the best for me. So Lot did just that. 
He looked out at the land and he chose what looked to be the best. In fact, in verse 10, it even compares the land to the Garden of Eden. It says it looks like the Garden of the Lord. However, there's an interesting comparison here. He compares the land to the Garden of Eden. And just like Eve made the wrong decision because she chose what looked good, here Lot makes the wrong decision because he chooses what looks good. This is the way the world thinks. This is the way the world acts. The world says, do what's best for you. Take as much as you can. Get as much as you can. Get the absolute best that you can. Whatever looks good to you, take it. How'd that work out for Lot? Look at verses 12 and 13. So Abram settled in the land of Canaan, while Lot settled among the cities of the valley and moved his tent as far as Sodom. Now the men of Sodom were wicked, great sinners against the Lord. Lot followed the wisdom of this world. He did what was best for him, and he ultimately ended up in Sodom, a place that the Scripture says was wicked and described as great sinners against the Lord. As we see, as we continue, we're going to get into Genesis chapter 18 and and Genesis chapter 19. What you're going to find is Lot's decision right here in Genesis chapter 13 is going to cost him everything. Ultimately, it costs him his wife. Because he took what looked good. He ignored everything else. And this is no surprise. Lot just demonstrates an important truth. I want you to write this down. When we prioritize the things of this world, we look just like the world. When we prioritize the things of this world, we look just like the world. That's what Lot did. Lot said, you know what? This looks great. I'm going to go there. Yes, there's a city over there called Sodom. Yes, the people are evil. Yes, they don't obey the Lord. But it's okay. I'm just going to go hang out near them. Very soon, hanging out near them ends up living with them and causing huge problems. As Christians, we need to remember that we are called to be different. We are called to not look like the world. Jesus says that we are supposed to be the salt of the earth, the light of the world. We're supposed to look different, act different, talk different. Everything about us should be different. We're supposed to stand out from the world. When we look just like everybody else, we're not following Christ. And when we start to prioritize what the world prioritizes, we can't then be surprised when we look just like the world looks. That means we don't do what Lot did. We don't make decisions based merely on what we see or what we think looks good. Because listen to me, church, we know or we should know that looks can be deceiving. Satan is described as the father of what? Lies. He is the father of lies. So when I look out the world and I see, I see things that look good, when I hear things that sound good to everybody else, I need to be very cautious. Because I don't make decisions based on what I see or what I hear. What does Paul tell me in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7? He says, For we walk by faith and not by sight. Amen. We walk by faith and not by sight. That means I don't make decisions based on what I see and what I hear. I make decisions based on my faith in Jesus Christ. I make decisions based on what the Bible tells me, on what Scripture says, and I believe the Word of God. And that's how I make my decisions. Again, Pastor Kent Hughes says something of Lot that is sadly true for many Christians today. Here's what he says. He says, Lot was the kind of man who would certainly choose heaven over hell if given the choice, but not heaven over earth. Material prosperity was the bottom line. Listen closely to me today. There are a lot of people who if you said you want to go to heaven or you want to go to hell, they're going to choose heaven, right? We're all going to choose heaven over hell. But there are a lot of people who won't choose heaven over earth. They want what they want now. 
They want what looks good now. They want what sounds good now. They want to do what feels good now. And so they are choosing earth. They are choosing this place, the place where Satan is in charge. Now, of course, ultimately God is in charge of all things, including earth. But the Bible tells us that Satan is the prince of the power of the air. Tells us that this is his domain because of our sin. And there are a whole lot of people who would choose earth over heaven. This is a huge mistake. Why? Because our ultimate reward is not an earthly reward. Our ultimate reward is not earthly wealth. Our reward is not here and now. Our reward is in the future. And we see this truth in Genesis chapter 13. In the final verses of this chapter, God rewards Abram's faith by reminding him of his future. Let's read these verses together. Genesis chapter 13, verses 14 through 18. Starting in verse 14, the Scripture says, The Lord said to Abram, after Lot had separated from him, Lift up your eyes and look from the place where you are, northward and southward and eastward and westward. For all the land that you see I will give to you and to your offspring forever. I will make your offspring as the dust of the earth, so that if one can count the dust of the earth, your offspring also can be counted. Arise, walk through the length and the breadth of the land, for I give it to you. So Abram moved his tent and came and settled by the oaks of Mamre, which are at Hebron. And there he built an altar to the Lord. I love this verse. Probably my favorite verse there is uh, verse 14, because notice what he says. Abram tells Lot, hey, if you want to go left, go left, and I'll go right. right? So if you want to go west, I'll go east. If you want to go east, I'll go west. And the Lord comes and says, hey, Abram, look north, south, east, and west. It's all yours. It's all yours. It doesn't matter which way Lot went. I couldn't care less which way Lot went. Fine, he went west and you went east. I'm going to give you the west and the east and the north and the south because I promised this to you and I'm going to give you exactly what I promised. Now, don't, don't miss this because in these verses, God reminds Abram of his promise. However, these promises were not fulfilled immediately. In fact, the ultimate fulfillment of the promise Abram never even saw in his life. Why? Because it's not the here and now that matters. Abram doesn't even live to see the ultimate fulfillment, but he believes. He has faith. He understands that the reward is not an earthly reward. In the same way, Christians, we are promised an eternal reward in the future. We are not promised riches here on this earth. We are not promised wealth. We are not promised health. We are not promised an easy life. What we are promised is that in eternity, we're going to have the north, the south, the east, and the west. Most importantly, we're going to have a relationship with our Savior Jesus Christ in the flesh, in person. This life is not our reward. Riches, wealth, possessions, the things of this world are not our reward. Our reward is in heaven. Jesus Christ did not die on the cross to give us an earthly reward that fades away. That's what I want you to understand. It's not that God is not giving us an earthly reward now because He couldn't or He can't. He absolutely can. But He's giving us something better. He's giving us something more. Jesus Christ died and rose again so that He could give you something so much better. Not an earthly reward that's temporary, but an eternal heavenly reward. A reward that will never fade away. This is why Jesus tells us in Matthew chapter 6, verses 19-21, through 21, He says, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. What we see in Genesis 13 demonstrates the truth of Jesus' words and demonstrates one final lesson I want you to see this morning. If you're keeping notes, write this down. Our reward is eternity and our treasure is in heaven. Our reward is eternity and our treasure is in heaven. This world has nothing to offer you. Everything here is temporary. It's fleeting. Our reward is eternity. 
with our Savior Jesus Christ. That is what we are looking forward to. That is what we are hoping for. As we close this morning, there's really just one question that we need to ask ourselves. Where is your treasure? Are you storing up treasures here? Are you trying to buy newer and more expensive cars and houses and clothes, taking trip after trip, accumulating more and more? It's temporary. It will not last. And it will never give you joy and peace. Or are you storing up treasure in heaven? Are you investing your life in things that have eternal value? Are you investing everything that you have, your your time, your talents, your treasure, your skills, are you investing everything in the kingdom of God? Are you growing more and more like Christ every single day? Are you proclaiming the gospel to the lost? Are you investing in the lives of other Christians, helping them grow, helping them mature? Listen to me. Jesus said, love your neighbor as yourself, right? The second great commandment is to love one another. Our relationship as brothers and sisters in Christ is eternal. We are going to be family, not just today or this month or this year, but we are going to be eternal family for the rest of this life and all of the next. What matters most is that we invest in the kingdom of God. So again, I ask, where is your treasure? If the answer is that your treasure is here on earth, then Jesus says that that's where your heart is. And if your heart is with earthly treasure, it means Jesus Christ doesn't have your heart. But you can make a change today. You can repent today. You can return to Christ today. You can give your heart and your life to Him. If you're here today and you've never made that decision, you've never made the decision to surrender to Christ, to surrender everything to Christ, you can do so today. If you're here today and you are a believer, but you struggle here, you struggle with the issue of money and possessions and wealth, surrender is the word. Surrender it to Christ. Don't store up treasure here. Store up treasure in eternity. If you would stand this morning. Miss Deborah is going to come this morning with Miss Misty. We're going to open up these altars. I ask you just to bow your heads and close your eyes this morning. This is an opportunity for you to be alone with the Lord. We're just going to spend some time in prayer. You can pray right where you are. Maybe you want to come forward this morning to the altar. You say, well, what's, what's the difference? Let me tell you, there is something powerful about kneeling before a holy God. You want to talk about surrender? Our physical posture matters. We're told to kneel before God. We're told to raise our hands in worship. Yes, you can absolutely pray right where you are. But maybe you want to come this morning and surrender to the Lord. You want to kneel before a holy God and tell Him, Lord, I, just, I give you everything. I've been holding back. I've been valuing money too much. I've been valuing possessions too much. I want to give it all to you. I want to trust you. These altars are open this morning if you want to come and kneel before the Lord. If you want someone to pray with you, we have individuals up here who would be happy to pray with you. As Ms. Deborah sings, I encourage you to spend some time in prayer this morning asking the Lord, is this a problem for me? Lord, show me where my heart is. And if this is a problem for me, Lord, help me to repent and trust in you. Let's pray now.
Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you today fully acknowledging, God, that the greatest treasure is the treasure of Christ. God, we thank you for sending your Son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for our sins. Jesus, we thank you for being willing. We thank you for your resurrection, for our salvation. Lord, I pray each and every day that we get up and that we treasure you above all else. That we recognize, yes, living in this world, money absolutely can be useful. And Lord God, I pray that our needs are met. You encourage us in the Lord's Prayer to pray that our needs are met. So Lord, I pray for everyone here. I pray for their financial condition. I pray that their needs are met. But Lord, most importantly, I pray that we treasure you above all else. That we recognize that you are the greatest treasure. And that we invest our lives in the kingdom, knowing that we are storing up eternal treasure in heaven. So we leave here, Lord, I ask that you watch over us, that you protect us, that you continue to meet our needs. In your name I pray. Amen. You are dismissed. Yes. Put both of them right there right now. I'd go quickly. <laughs>